Welcome to the Wheat Zoomer Module 2. In the first module, we walked briefly through the panels on the Wheat Zoomer and described the markers on each panel, then discussed a quick interpretation of a patient's test. In Module 2, we will begin to dive deeper into the structure and function of the intestinal epithelial barrier and discuss its role in the immunity as well as the mechanisms behind intestinal permeability. Without further ado, let's jump right in. We'll start out by reviewing the wheat zoomer panels and markers briefly in case it has been some time since you've watched module one. Then we'll discuss some factors that may affect your patient's test results you should consider before running the wheat zoomer. We'll spend the majority of this module discussing the mechanisms behind intestinal permeability and how the intestinal epithelial barrier plays a role in nutrient absorption, interacts with the intestinal microbiome, and its role in inflammation. The wheat zoomer starts off with total immunoglobulins so that you can assess whether the patient you are running the test on has a great enough pool of immunoglobulins present to measure their reactivity to the antigens tested. And then test for overt celiac disease through traditional serological markers of transglutaminase 2 and dm dated gliadin peptide. We then have Vibrant's proprietary TTG DGP fusion peptide, which is an early marker for celiac disease, elevating anywhere from 14 months to four years before traditional serological markers do. Following that on the first page, we have the intestinal permeability panel, which today's module will dive into in great detail about the mechanisms behind intestinal permeability and loss of barrier integrity. Next, we look at differential transglutaminases that relate to integumentary and neurological gluten-mediated autoimmunity, TTG3 and TTG6, respectively. Then the lectin component of wheat, which is wheat germaglutinin, and actual wheat allergies mediated by IgE mast cell reactions. We then have a robust panel of gliadin isoform antibodies, which also includes antibodies to gluteomorphin and proteinorphin, the opioid-like breakdown products of gluten and wheat, respectively, and glutenin, which is the sister peptide to gliadin, when bound together to form the protein complex that is gluten before it is enzymatically cleaved in the digestive tract. These panels are here to point out if your patient is gluten sensitive because these are proteins specific to gluten. And last, we have the non-gluten wheat proteins found only on Vibrant's wheat zoomer. These proteins make up the 25 to 30 percent of the wheat proteome that is not gluten associated and are distinct to wheat only. Through internal data, we have found that about 10 percent of individuals who have had a wheat zoomer run are sensitive only to these proteins and no gluten related proteins, which is significant if you think about testing through other companies that do not offer these and how many patients may be missed due to the false assumption that they do not react to any proteins in wheat only by testing for gluten. Also recently, Vibrant introduced pediatric reference ranges to the wheat zoomer. If you send in a patient sample that is under the age of 18 at the time the sample is received, it will automatically be run as a pediatric sample with those ranges. So we often get asked um, a few questions for the wheat zoomer, and it's important to notice several things before running a wheat zoomer. Patients and providers commonly ask if the gluten-free status of the patient affects the test results, and it does. If the patient is 100% gluten-free at the time of the blood draw, they will have little to no elevated antibody response to the peptides tested. You have a couple of options at this point. You can ask the patient to reintroduce small servings of gluten-containing foods for about seven to 10 days prior to the blood draw. Or you can draw the test anyway, realizing that most individuals that think they are gluten-free are probably not completely successfully eliminating gluten and they will still have some mild antibody response. The intestinal permeability panel will be reactive independent of gluten consumption, and it's not affected by the gluten-free status of the patient. Plan to retest your patient at least once after the initial test, um, approximately 90 to 120 days after you start your intervention, in order to assess if they are progressing appropriately and truly adhering to your protocol for nutrition and supplementation. Cessation of symptoms is not always a good indicator of healing, especially if some supplements you place your patient on may mask symptoms like digestive enzymes or probiotics. The only way to know if antibodies are declining is to retest. Patients taking immunosuppressive drugs will often have non-reactive antibody tests, including the wheat zoomer, because the medication suppresses endogenous antibody production. This is a list of the most common immunosuppressive drugs, some asthma inhalers may have a short-term effect on antibody tests, possibly up to two weeks after use. 
Oral and injective immunosuppressive drugs should be avoided for at least 30 days prior to antibody testing. If a medication is injected and lasts for 90 days, the patient should wait until 30 days after that 90 days is up to consider antibody testing, so 120 days after their shot. Antihistamines do not affect antibody tests. The wheat tumor includes total immunoglobulin levels for IgA and IgG in order to assist providers in interpreting the test results. If a patient has low or low normal immunoglobulin levels for either or both IgA and IgG, the wheat zoomer and other antibody tests may appear largely non-reactive. You can, however, look at the values that are in the in-control range and compare them to the reference range. For instance, in a patient with low total IgA and IgG, antiglidin antibodies above 0 0.70 may still be relevant, even though the upper end of the in-control reference range is 0.89 despite not flagging as moderate or high risk, because relative to that patient's total immunoglobulin pool, that can still indicate a higher than normal antibody response. Another consideration is that even, even when a patient has low total IgA, if IgG is normal, the IgG antibodies on the test will still be accurate reflections of that patient's IgG response to the tested peptides. In children, antibody response varies based on age and immune exposure. Therefore, Vibrant has established those pediatric ranges for values that were determined to be different in pediatrics. All right, now that we've gotten the basics out of the way, let's move on to some better understanding of the mechanisms of intestinal permeability and what you may need to consider when interpreting the intestinal permeability panel on the wheat zoomer. The intestinal epithelial barrier is one of the most critical systems to consider when we're discussing chronic disease. Its central role in acting is both a physical and biochemical barrier between the host and microorganisms who symbiotically inhabit the host is where we'll start. All facets of this system, including the epithelial cells, cellular receptors, metabolites, sensing, microbes, and immune response must play their part in order for homeostasis to be maintained. The purpose of this barrier is to keep the right things in while keeping the wrong things out. This is a very complex, ever-changing system of interactions. Um, this messaging between the host and the microbiome is going back and forth at all times, and it must continue to in order to main ba maintain balance. So we have a, a physical and biochemical barrier standing in between the host and, and its microorganisms that live within it, and that barrier regulates flow of solutes and nutrients across between the cells and through the cells. Um, there's constant antigen sampling going on in surveillance by our immune cells as well as by certain types of cell types in the barrier. And then we also have the barrier there to support tissue repair after injury or acute inflammation. Uh, and the microbiome is actually part of that repair process. Other critical tasks and actions involving the epithelial barrier include responding to microbial signals that allow tolerance as we're continuously exposed to our commensal bacteria. We don't want to mount immune responses against things like bifidobacterium, for instance. We also want to convey the signals coming from our microbiome back to our mucosal immune cells in order to coordinate immune responses in case we do need to mount an, a response against commensal bacteria, perhaps that have overgrown or invaded places where they shouldn't be, as well as enteric pathogens um, such as Clostridium difficile. We also have regulation of B cell and T cell responses occurring here in the epithelium, um, and these responses act on the intestinal barrier both to control inflammation, promote inflammation, or squash inflammation, depending on what's needed. And then we also locally regulate that immune response at the barrier through influencing those innate and adaptive immune systems. Put more simply, the intestinal epithelial barrier and especially the epithelial cells are part of a system developed to protect the host, live symbiotically with commensal organisms, and repair and heal. It is not simply enough to just throw glutamine and a probiotic at a leaky gut and assume it's going to work. There are complex roots of inflammation that should also be considered when attempting to bring balance back to the intestinal epithelium after major inflammatory processes have taken hold. This next section will consist of describing the parts of the epithelial barrier, including cell types, cellular receptors, and some of the elements of immune coordination between the microbiota and the host. This is all going to be relevant to the discussion of healing a permeable or leaky gut because we first have to understand how things break before we can understand the most effective ways to fix them. 
This image is showing us how the epithelium differs between small and large intestines, but overall functions much the same as a main physical and immune barrier between the host and the microbiome. The epithelial layer is home to a majority of the body's immune system, which simply samples microbes, micro microbial signals, and environmental factors to determine if an immune response is necessary. The signals going back and forth between the host and microbes are constant and are the foundation for how the innate and adaptive immune responses function, which determine whether the epithelial layer either thrives or weakens. Understanding these mechanisms will help you better understand how to bring an inflamed intestinal barrier back to a state of calm and homeostasis. One thing I do want to point out is that there, there should definitely be an understanding that um, in addition to pathogenic microbes that can invade and cause disruption of the barrier, our own immune system can also cause disruption of the barrier to facilitate movement of our immune cells, for instance, our T cells or B cells, across the barrier from the basal side to the luminal side to attack a pathogen that has invaded, for instance. Um, and so there is this ability to control permeability both in a good way and a bad way. Um, and so understand that permeability in some cases is good. However, when it is chronic or, or pathological, that's when it becomes problematic. So here we have a diagram of what the basics of the epithelial lining looks like. You have your epithelial cells or enterocytes, a combination of other types of cells, which we'll discuss in a bit. Uh, but those include goblet cells, M cells, and dendritic cells. You've also got the immune response from IgA, which is the prominent, I'm sorry, predominant immunoglobulin in the mucosal surfaces of the body. You have commensal bacteria that inhabit the mucosal surfaces, which we'll discuss in detail in a later module, as well as in the modules for the gut zoomer. And then we have the structures in the lamina propria, which is the layer of tissue and cells just below the enterocytes. The lamina propria contains the Peyer's patches, circulatory vesicles, as well as lymph vesicles, and then additional immune cells waiting for activation, such as macrophages and undifferentiated T cells and B cells. This is a diagram of the entire gastrointestinal tract and sites of nutri nutrient absorption so that you can see, depending on the location of the inflammation in the digestive tract, you may be looking at multiple types of nutrient malabsorption. Despite your patient eating enough of a nutrient, they can still be malabsorbing simply because the intestinal lining that is there to absorb that is inflamed and is dysfunctional. If you're not already running vibrant micronutrient testing alongside the wheat zoomer, this may help demonstrate why those two tests complement each other very well, especially when inflammatory digestive conditions are present, but also when extra intestinal inflammatory conditions present and how those may be linked to nutrient malabsorption in the small or large intestines. Here we have a great comparison of the difference between the mucosa in the small intestine and that of the large intestine. There are limited microbes that reside in the small intestinal mucosa layer, while the majority of microbial populations are found in the outer mucosa of the large intestine. The villi and crypts are also shaped differently depending on whether we are looking at the small or large intestinal mucosa. In the large intestine, the inner mucosa is actually attached to the luminal surface of the intestinal epithelial cell, while the outer mucosa sits loosely on top of it and acts as both a medium for microbes to colonize, as well as a food source for some of them, such as Acromantia mucinophila. Some species of microbes can inhabit the inner mucosa living nearer to the crypts, while most remain in the outer mucosa where they can more easily find substrates to ferment. The important thing to know here is that the mucosa is the protective barrier over our enterocytes and its health and stability directly impact barrier integrity or permeability. Part of the strength and stability of the mucosa is imparted by bacteria that inhabit it. So this is where we see when certain bacterial populations are suppressed due to antibiotic use, for instance, or exposure to something antimicrobial over time, when we lose certain populations of bacteria or they are weakened or suppressed or they're not abundant enough, the mucosa actually suffers and becomes weaker and is less functional because we're missing that control mechanism or that bacteria that's there to help fortify that mucosal layer. Here we see another depiction of the intestinal epithelial layers, including the, the mucosa and the lamina propria. Of importance to note here are the various immune cells that reside in the epithelium. Panis cells in the crypts generate antimicrobial peptides, that's what's labeled AMPs there on the picture, 
in response to the signals from dendritic cells, uh, which you can see kind of reaching through the epithelial layer with their little feelers, as well as M cells that sense the luminal environment looking for pathogens or opportunists. These AMPs suppress the populations of those microbes we don't want to have too many of, and certain commensal bacteria can also make these. We'll discuss the importance of this to the epithelial barrier more in depth during future modules and in the gut zoomer modules. The takeaway from this slide is that the mucosal layer is where the majority of immune sensing and training is occurring, including how the innate and adaptive immune systems recognize friend from foe, such as foods we commonly consume, for example, gluten, and microbes we want to live in harmony with versus microbes who tend to cause inflammation. The important parts of the cell we'll discuss next are the cytoskeleton and cellular receptors. Cellular receptors are found on the luminal surface of the epithelial cells and are activated when a substance, such as a cytokine or a bacterial endotoxin, binds to the receptor and causes the release of a target, such as maybe another cytokine, or substances like antimicrobial peptides. Cellular receptors can sense microbes present, nutrients present from dietary intake, endotoxins, substances such as zonulin, which regulates cell junction permeability, and even environmental conditions such as the pH of the lumen and mechanical movement of the intestinal tract. Here we're looking at a critical mechanism to the intestinal epith epithelial cell's ability to survive, regenerate, and remain strong. Various cytokines are produced throughout the epithelial layer, some of which are pro-inflammatory, but some of which are actually anti-inflammatory. IL-22 is of the latter class and has been found to be immensely connected to the proliferation and survival of intestinal epithelial cells. I just want to highlight here that it's very important to understand that not all cytokines are bad, and not all cytokine responses should be considered inflammatory in a bad way. Some cytokines wear dual hats and can be both helpful or harmful depending on the context of the reaction and the overall balance of the system. For the most part, interleukin-22 is anti-inflammatory or pro-healing if you want to think of it that way. It influences things like T-cell differentiation, which is critical. We need our T-cells to differentiate into T-regs in order to suppress things like autoimmunity or allergies, for instance. Um, so that's, that's one function of IL-22 that we need to have. So now that we've looked at the system as a whole on a very broad level, let's zoom in and start to take a little look at the cells and the tight junctions. Because after all, the tight junctions are where some of the permeability of the epithelial lining is occurring. Some of the relevant markers of tight junction function that vibrant measures are zonulin, antibodies to actin, antibodies to bacterial lipopolysaccharide, and antibodies to vinculin, which we measure on the IBS short test, not on the wheat zoomer. Zonulin and anti-zonulin antibodies are specific to the tight junctions, while actin and anti-actin antibodies can be either tight junction related or transcellular permeability related. Actin filaments are constantly turning over in the cytoskeleton by assembling and disassembling, which is one control mechanism for tight junction stability. While lipopolysaccharide is not a tight junction protein, its placement on the intestinal permeability panel reflects its significance as a sign of increased permeability as well as the involvement of overgrowths of gram-negative bacteria in that permeability, which both directly and impact, I'm sorry, directly and indirectly impact it as well. So we'll later discuss that um, in other modules as well as in the gut zoomer modules. Zonulin is most often associated with gluten or gluten's derivative gliadin by practitioners in the functional medicine world. However, it is important to understand that gluten sensitivity is but one mechanism behind the dissociation of zonulin out of the tight junction, which increases permeability. Zonulin's role is actually to act as the mortar, so to speak, between the intestinal epithelial cells. Any mechanism that increases the release of zonulin away from the tight junction and into the cytoplasm, or even the lumen of the intestines, is breaking up that mortar and reducing stability and regulatory flow through the tight junctions. <clears throat> Individuals who have a variety of inflammatory gastrointestinal disorders have been found not only to have less total zonulin expressed in the tight junctions of their epithelial cells, but what's found is that of the zonulin they have, the more they actually have more of it liberated from the tight junction, leaving those junctions sort of undefended. Regardless of the cause of the redistribution of, zon of zonulin away from the tight junction, the result is the same. We have increased barrier permeability, um, and, and that's what we're looking to solve here. 
So besides gliadin, things that are most likely to increase dissociation of zonulin include bacteria. Certain bacteria can actually increase the release of it from the tight junction, bacterial endotoxins, certain cytokines that can be released, um, as well as high fat or ketogenic diets increase the release of zonulin away from the tight junction. The anti-actin antibodies measured on the wheat zoomer are specific to F-actin, which is found specifically only in intestinal epithelial cells. This isomer of actin plays a critical role in the structure and function of the intestinal cell, its tight junctions, and regulation of those. Actin is both a structural protein that holds up the shape of the cell as part of its cytoskeleton and is in control of parts of the cellular junction complexes, both at the tight junctions, where zonulin resides, and at the adherence junctions, which are just below those tight junctions. Actin filaments act as a contractible belt that can pull apart or seal together the adherence junctions. Antibodies to actin indicate damage to either or both the intestinal epithelial cell's body and structure, as well as to the tight junction complex, which regulates barrier permeability. Lipopolysaccharide is a bacterial endotoxin produced only by gram-negative bacteria. It resides in the outer membrane of the microbe and is released either when the microbe dies and the cell membrane degrades, or by the bacteria in response to a threat as a protective mechanism. LPS binds to receptors found on the luminal side of intestinal epithelial cells, where it initiates a cascade of inflammatory response. Under normal circumstances, little to no LPS should be translocating across the epithelial barrier. However, when barrier function is impaired, either at the tight junction or cells are damaged themselves, LPS gains access to the circulatory system, especially when greater amounts of fat are consumed, which we'll discuss later, and it reacts with both lipids in the bloodstream as well as with a number of cells and tissues in the heart, arteries, joints, lungs, brain, nerves, and internal organs. On the subject of lipopolysaccharide, one of the important cytokines that is induced when LPS is present is interleukin-18. In addition to being elevated during treatment for HIV, as in the study presented, IL-18 is also elevated in individuals with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, inflammatory bowel disease, myocarditis, and individuals with Alzheimer's disease. IL-18's role in intestinal permeability is actually pretty significant due to its ability to both disassemble actin filaments as well as other tight junction proteins. IL-18 stimulates natural killer cells and interferon gamma, which then activate mast cells. Greater levels of IL-18 also increase production of IgG from B cells. If you're concurrently running food sensitivity testing alongside the wheat zoomer and observe heightened IgG antibodies to multiple foods, as well as intestinal permeability, it would be very appropriate to address the IL-18 cytokine pathway through balancing Th1 and Th2 responses, as IL-18 can be either pro or anti-inflammatory, depending on the co-activation of other cytokines present such as IL-17 in Th2-dominant immune responses and IL-12, 13, and 15 in Th1-dominant immune responses. Next, we'll take some time to discuss important features of the intestinal epithelial layer and why they are relevant to the topic of intestinal permeability, as well as the role they play in healing. Some important elements in the epithelial layer are receptors, mostly those on the epithelial cells, metabolites of bacteria, and nutrients and metabolites from our diet, as well as those produced endogenously. All of these work in concert to protect the epithelial barrier, strengthen the immune tolerance in the digestive tract, and cause or prevent inflammation when necessary. G-protein coupled receptors are a major player in the immune activation and inflammatory response in the epithelial layer, which directly impacts permeability. A wide range of substances can bind to and activate GPCRs depending on what type of receptor it is. Examples of metabolites that bind to and activate GPCRs are short-chain fatty acids, omega-3s, of which DHA especially appears to have a role, nicotinic acid or niacin, and medium and long-chain fatty acids. The image here is depicting how short-chain fatty acids from fiber fermentation by commensal microbes bind to GPCRs, which then activate IL-18 and other cytokines that have immunomodulatory effects, like we just discussed, as well as repair mechanisms in the epithelial layer. So in order to eat, we, we eat this food, it's fermented by our bacteria, then the metabolite of that fermentation binds to the G-protein coupled receptor, which triggers a series of immune activation of certain cytokines um, or suppression of other pro-inflammatory cytokines, depending on what we're doing. But in some cases, pro-inflammatory is not a bad thing, especially if there's been damage and we need to heal. That inflammation is actually a good thing. 
In the absence of adequate fiber, so if we're not eating those foods that can be fermented, especially certain types, especially the ones containing short-chain fatty acids or that can be fermented to produce short-chain fatty acids, the G-protein coupled receptors do not activate the sequences that stimulate repair and immune modulation, which results in an inflamed epithelial lining, loss of barrier integrity, and greater translocation of foreign proteins across the epithelial barrier with increased incidence of IBS, IBD, and other autoimmune conditions. So here, I just wanna take a minute to connect the dots. Again, we have dietary intake, especially high in fiber, variety of foods high in fiber, microbial metabolites from that, specifically short-chain fatty acids, which induce these receptors on our epithelial cells, which in turn promote repair of the epithelial barrier and increase its ability to act as that barrier between the world and our body. So it's very important to recognize the role that various dietary metabolites play in proper stimulation of the immune system, as well as keeping balance in its responses. Many of these metabolites bind to receptors, such as G-protein coupled receptors, and activate anti-inflammatory mechanisms that directly contribute to epithelial barrier integrity. Without the correct intake of fiber from a variety of sources, and without the right balance of microbes to ferment that fiber into these metabolites, this system of metabolite sensing to prime the immune system is very dysfunctional and inflammatory conditions develop, both locally to the intestinal tract and once barrier integrity is lost, extra intestinally in the form of chronic inflammatory conditions or autoimmune disease. Okay, so we have a lot going on here, but the important points to note are that another type of cellular receptor called aryl hydrocarbon receptors is known to interact with a wide range of hydrocarbons found both in foods as well as produced by microbes, and then some that enter the body from the environment. These aryl hydrocarbon receptors respond to the hydrocarbons they are exposed to, and depending on the type of compound, will produce either anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory responses through mechanisms such as IL-22, which we've talked about, antimicrobial peptides also we've talked about, and they even influence T cell differentiation. How this connects to intestinal permeability is that if aryl hydrocarbon receptor function is suppressed, perhaps because diet is not appropriately high in those hydrocarbons that are beneficial, through things like cruciferous veggies, for instance, or because of increased inflammatory conditions present, IL-22 production will be suppressed and the epithelial barrier loses a critical component of its stability, it becomes compromised and permeability to contents of the intestinal lumen will result. Um, so we can think of this as an example of dietary intake of cruciferous veggies, which contain high amounts of beneficial hydrocarbons that turn these receptors on to make IL-22, which promotes barrier function and healing. On the other hand, if we have too many hydrocarbons coming from environmental pollutants, for instance, so DDT or dioxin are examples of that, as well as pathogens like candida, we don't turn on these receptors that activate IL-22, we turn them on and something else is produced that is incredibly inflammatory, but without IL-22, we don't have enough of the beneficial hydrocarbons coming in, we have an imbalanced system, and there's no repair and regeneration of the epithelial barrier being stimulated, so we lose barrier integrity. Bile acid receptors are another critical cellular receptor found in the intestinal epithelial layer and that play a significant role in barrier integrity. These receptors recognize both primary and secondary bile acids. Once bile acids bind to these receptors, a whole host of downstream effects occur, including GLP-1 production, which regulates blood sugar levels through enhancing secretion of insulin postprandially. This directly contributes to insulin sensitivity, or in the absence of bile acid receptor activation, insulin resistance. There are also anti-inflammatory mechanisms at work when bile acid receptors are activated, which also reduce the ability of microbes to colonize the small intestine, which, as you may be aware, leads to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO. Without adequate bile acid production, concentration in the gallbladder, and flow from the gallbladder into the duodenum, there can be major impairment of bile acid receptor signaling. So now that we've explored some of the important mechanisms behind how various receptor types are influenced by metabolites, microbes, and environmental compounds to affect immunity and barrier integrity, let's discuss how these mechanisms work at the cell level to gain even further understanding of how barrier integrity functions.
There are five main types of cells that are influential in barrier integrity, and the immune response either fortifies the epithelial barrier or can lead to its demise. Dendritic cells sense the environmental conditions such as microbes present, goblet cells contribute to the mucosal stability, immune cells police the environment and respond to threats, enteroendocrine cells produce hormones and neurotransmitters that affect motility and function, and in cells pull in substances and microbes to alert the immune system to possible threats. We'll start off with introducing the dendritic cells, which are antigen pre presenting cells found in the intestinal epithelial layer. Their job is to sample the luminal environment and present antigens to the body's T cells in the lamina propria, after which those T cells activate an immune response. Another important function of dendritic cells, however, is to help our T cells differentiate self from non-self. And this is critical in the discussion of barrier integrity and recognizing antigens, such as commonly consumed foods and commensal bacteria, both of which we do not want to activate immune attacks on, most of the time anyway. Goblet cells are an important integral part of the epithelial layer because they produce the mucus that acts as the protective coating over the enterocytes. Without this, there, would be, there wouldn't be anything standing between undigested food particles, bacteria, viruses, environmental toxins, and the enterocytes. There would also be nowhere for our commensal bacteria to adhere and provide protection through both competitive inhibition of pathogens and pathobionts, but also through production of metabolites that activate anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory immune responses from the adaptive and innate immune systems. Another type of cell found along the epithelial lining is the enteroendocrine cell. While it does not necessarily play a very direct role in barrier integrity itself, it does host G protein coupled receptors, which do signal the production of various substances that contribute to barrier integrity. The important things to understand about enteroendocrine cells are that they produce a wide range of hormones, enzymes, and neurotransmitters that are directly responsible for appetite, digestive function, motility, and microbial tolerance to our commensal bacteria. These things do eventually directly impact barrier integrity. There is a two-way crosschalk going on between the enteroendocrine cells and the commensal microbes we host. So what that means is based on what nutrients interact with these enteroendocrine cells, we either get a balanced immune response or imbalanced immune response while, while results in loss of barrier integrity if it's imbalanced. Where we do see some direct contribution to barrier integrity is through the actions of the M cells or microfold cells. These are found in the epithelial layer as well, and they are constantly sampling the environment of the intestinal lumen for microbes that may pose a threat. Because of their location over or near the Peyer's patches, they are able to grab microbial antigens through endocytosis or phagocytosis and present those antigens to dendritic cells, which then instruct T cells to respond to the threat. The antigen is also then phagocytosed by the dendritic cell to neutralize it. Without this critical immune function and interaction with the commensal microbiome, we lose tolerance to beneficial microbes, so we don't know who's our friend and who's not and we're unable to defend as well against the pathogens we encounter. As we lose barrier integrity, this inflammatory response remains unchecked. So to summarize briefly what we've covered here in module two, we discussed the structure and function of the mucosa and epithelial cells, which act as physical barriers, as well as the site for nutrient absorption. The mucosa provides a binding site for commensal microbes, which directly contribute to barrier health and integrity, as well as aid the human host in metabolite production and immune tolerance. Next, we discuss the relevant tight junction structures and function and the role that the tight junctions play in controlling the flow of substances from inside the intestinal lumen to the apical side of the intestinal barrier, as well as how these tight junctions are affected by microbes, endotoxins, metabolites, and other antigens. In the tight junctions, we talked about the relevant tight junction proteins like the actocytoskeleton and belt, zonulin's influence on the tight junctions, and lipopolysaccharide's influence on the tight junctions. Next, we discuss several types of cellular receptors that influence barrier integrity, including G-protein coupled receptors, aryl hydrocarbon receptors, and bile acid receptors, and how when those receptors are not appropriately activated and cannot activate certain cytokines, barrier integrity is lost. <laughs>
And last, we discussed several types of epithelial cells that are connected to the health integrity of the epithelial barrier, including dendritic cells that sense the microbial environment, goblet cells that generate mucus, enteroendocrine cells with their G protein coupled receptors influencing immune tolerance, and M cells that endocytose and phagocytose the antigens to present them to T cells in the adaptive immune system. The takeaway from this module is that cells and cell receptors that line the epithelial layer are constantly interacting with our food and microbes, and based on those interactions, these cells and receptors either decide to keep the peace or activate our immune responses. Whether or not this system is balanced ultimately depends on what we eat and our microbiome makeup, and whether or not this system is balanced affects whether our intestinal barrier and tight junctions are able to remain stable and fortified to protect us from everything transmitting through the intestinal lumen. All right, so that includes this module of the Wheat Zoomer training. Next up, we'll discuss in module three, what roles the microbiome plays in barrier integrity and immune tolerance, and how this system can be rebuilt or adapted to reinstate calm and stability to the intestinal epithelial layer.